Good morning, church family. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's give him praise in it. Would you stand together as we sing?
Welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside, uh, where we exist to multiply disciples to the glory of God. We do that by pursuing Christ, living connected, and sharing good news. I want to zero in on that living connected piece because that's super important for what we do and why we exist here on the east side of town. So one of the things I wanted to flag for you, if you didn't get one of these on the way in, this is our Connect card. This is a great way for you to uh, get to know the church here at Christ Fellowship Beside, a great way for us to establish connection. We'll send you a text message and an email, and hopefully those will get through to you, and uh, we'll be able to at least connect and get um, get coffee or lunch or something like that together. And it's a great way to just kind of get to know you. Uh, as well, on the back, there's a place for you to put prayer requests and things that even if you have kind of an anonymous prayer request or something that's on your heart, you can feel free to put that uh, in there. And then there's a little drop box in the back. You can put that in. I wanted to flag a couple other ways that we can live connected. Uh, the next thing up is tonight is our family night. And family nights, if you haven't been to one, is a great place to get to know your fellow believers here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. Uh, we share a meal together and spend time just sharing updates on the life of the church and a lot of other interesting factoids about uh, ministry here so that we're all in sync and on the same page. And it's, uh, it's a great opportunity, not only for our members to remain connected and be able to connect across the different small groups and to be able to see people uh, and spend a meal together in that way. But it's also a great chance for those of you who are checking out East Side and trying to figure out, is this the right place for me and my family to be able to see a little bit of the culture of our church and how we do things. And so this may be a little bit different for you than the typical um, business meeting of a church kind of uh, scenario that, that's usually uh, contested and, and feisty and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're a family together and we want you to see us doing life together as a family, as the church. Um, another way to be connected is, is a means to connect with our neighbors around us. We have a game night on February the 9th, and this is a great low-key way to get to know our neighbors and to invite those who are into card games and table tabletop games and other things like that. Uh, we have, have some folks in our church that really enjoy those kinds of things, and it's a great way to invite those neighbors into a space where they can enjoy something together and build relationships that uh, enabled us to share good news through those. And last but not least, uh, I want to flag our groups. So you have a QR code up on the screen. If you are not part of a group and you want to be, um, which I hope that's that's most of our regulars, uh, this is a great way to get connected. Uh, right now, we have two small groups that are available on this page. If you are already logged into the Church Center app, it will take you into that app to go ahead and sign up for those. There are two small groups, and there are also two men's groups that are already up and ready to roll. Um, some of those are kind of kick-starting back up on the gender group side. Our small groups are kind of back up and meeting. We'll be adding another small group to this page in the coming weeks, and that small group will be meeting kind of in the Hudson Corners area, Lord willing, and uh, you can see Rodney for uh, questions on that, and then uh, the women will be starting another group, and that will be available on this page uh, very soon. I think that'll be um, Lena do you, uh, Thursdays, and do you know what time roughly? 6 a.m., right? <laughs> 6 p.m., it's good. It's better. Much better. Uh, 6 p.m. Women's, women's group. So look for that. It'll be on that page. And if you're not in the Church Center app, it's a great place to go. Uh, I wanted to uh, point our hearts to God's word as we get started here this morning. Rodney's been uh, pointing us to the book of Colossians, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And so uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you are all called in one body, rule your hearts, and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, 
in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This passage is a great passage on Christian unity, what we share in Christ that brings us together, that, that unites us in love. And one of the great ways that we exemplify that, it says, is through the singing of songs, hymns, spiritual songs. So what we're doing collectively together is a great visual representation of the unity that we all share in Christ. We're not just singing some songs that we enjoy. We're actually demonstrating and showing what has happened to us through Christ, this invisible bond that unites us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that's that's what we're doing and why we're doing it this morning. It, it is actually a form, it says, of teaching. We're all teaching each other through these songs and hymns to remind our hearts of the truths that we need to remember. So as we prepare our hearts uh, for continual worship, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the truth of the gospel, that even though uh, there are many things that externally could divide us, things that are vastly different among every single person in this room, that there is a unity that transcends all of that that comes through Christ. We celebrate that and lift you high this morning and pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, I just want to note that that music, as Pastor Phil has mentioned, is, is this tool for teaching. And, and the words that we uh, sing obviously can, can teach the mind and the heart, but music itself can teach the heart to rejoice no matter what it is feeling. And so as we move into these next three songs, uh, these are testimonial songs. And it's, uh, it's three declarations uh, that, that you get a chance to make, that we get a chance to make as a church. The first one is that Christ is our cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And as we sing through that, let that be your personal testimony. Let that be your declaration that, that, uh, that my hope is built on Jesus Christ. Then we'll sing Christ be magnified. As Christ is our cornerstone, as we are living with him as our foundation, it's his glory, his person, his uh, 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 character that shines through our life. Christ be magnified through me. Uh, you know, more of him, less of me, as we read in John 3.30. And then we sing uh, Where I'm Standing Now, a testimonial that says, Once I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but God, who is rich in his mercy, has made me alive to Jesus Christ. And I stand on the chain-breaking, miracle-making, powerful name of Jesus. So as we approach these three songs, think of them not as just like songs or, 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 or even just like group worship. Think of them as your personal testimony. And I pray that each and every one of you has these three declarations in your life, that you'd be known that Christ is your cornerstone, that Christ would be magnified through you, and that you, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, are standing free and forgiven this morning. So I invite you to stand together as we continue to worship with these songs of testimony.
won't bow. I won't bow down to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Death is just a doorway to resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. If you return in glory, I'll be angels and the saints. My heart will still be singing. My song will be the same. for Christ, his glory would shine through us in the way that we live, in the way that we parent, in the way that we do school, in the way that we just live our lives in front of other people. That he would get the glory for it. I want to invite you to take a seat as I read a passage of scripture that is perhaps one of the greatest testimonial passages in scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 so clearly articulates who we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but God, and who we are now because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. So let this let this declaration, let these truths wash over you this morning. Let them bring encouragement. Let them bring hope. Let them bring healing. Let them bring energy for declaring, energy for sharing, for not just being thankful for what's been done in my life, but, but, but sharing that with others so that what's been done in my life and your life can be done in the lives of those in our community, all to the glory of God. Ephesians 2 says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's who we were. That's what we did. But God, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved because of Jesus this is who we are we've been raised us up he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember. Remember who you were. Remember what God has done. Remember who you are now. That at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by the what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And with that testimony in mind this morning, we sing together, look standing now. Thou 
out of the wilderness into your deliverance. Look where I'm standing now. These hands that once were chained now lifted high in praise. Look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now. I stand on the chain break, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of together as we sing. Led by your mighty hand into the promised land. Look where I'm standing now. You carried the cross for me. Now I'm a child of the King. Look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now. I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of my Savior rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior God, we love you. We lift you up. We praise your name because you are worthy. Lord, the, the gospel declares your goodness. But not just your goodness for us, but your goodness for all people available to all who will call out to you. So, Lord, let us share, let us tell, let us declare of your goodness and your glory in our lives so that others can see more of you. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. As we get ready to um, 
declare the word of God this morning. I want us to do something. Um, we have some uh, mission partners, our one mission partners. And if you're new to our congregation, the way that we partner together with those that are doing gospel work all over the world. And uh, one of our partners, the Marks family, Neil and Beth and their five girls, they have been working hard uh, to raise funds and to prepare to go to France to do work through a ministry called Reaching and Teaching. And Reaching and Teaching does a lot of good theological work and helping to train national partners and to help support church plants, new churches, and uh, even established churches in the areas where those missionaries work. Last week, the Marks were trying to get their visa to go into France, and they were denied, and they went to the consulate in Atlanta. Well, this coming week, on the 2nd, they're going to D.C., and they're going to the embassy. And so I want us to take a moment to pray that the Lord will show favor to the Marks family and just generously treat them. They've worked so hard over the last couple of years to get ready to, to follow this calling to France. And I just want to give us a moment of silence, if you will. So I want to invite you to pray for the Marx family that the French government will grant them their visa so they can go do mission work in France. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I give you praise this morning. You are a good and gracious and merciful Father, and you're worthy of all praise. Father, your word says that we live because you desire for us to be in awe of you. And I am grateful that you have placed a calling on the, the marks on Beth and Neil, Lord, to go follow this call to make disciples in France. And Lord, you know their circumstance, you know their situation and what has happened this past week and then what is going to be happening this week. God, I take comfort in the fact that this is not any surprise to you. Their lives, their circumstances are fully open to you. And so, Father, on Friday when they go to the embassy in D.C. Uh, to make their appeal for a visa, that they can live in France and, and do the work that you've called them to. I pray, Father, that you would grant them favor. Lord, that they would be able to receive their visa, and by the end of this month, uh, the upcoming month, Lord, they would be able to be in France doing the work you've called them to. And Father, we praise you as you are building their faith and as you are working to bring glory to yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying for the marks this morning. I really appreciate that. If you've got a copy of the Bible, I want to ask you to look with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Currently, we are going through a series through the book of Ecclesiastes, and the teacher who is making observations about life, some of them spot on, some of those observations questionable, some filled with hope, some filled with despair. And we're going to break in today on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want to read this entire, uh, this entire chapter along with the first three verses of chapter 4. There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing, a time to search and a time to count as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. 
What does the worker gain from his struggles? I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He's made everything appropriate in its time. He's also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for them to rejoice and enjoy the good life. It is also the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his efforts. I know that everything God does will last forever. There is nothing to it or taken from it. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Let me read that passage again. God works so that people will be in awe of him. Whatever is has already been and whatever will be already is. However, God seeks justice for the persecuted. I also observed under the sun there is wickedness at the place of judgment and there is wickedness at the place of righteousness. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked since there is a time for every activity and every work. I said to myself, this happens so that God may test the children of Adam and they may see for themselves that they're like animals. For the fate of the children of Adam and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. People have no advantage over animals since everything is futile. All are going to the same place. All come from the dust and all return to the dust. Who knows if the spirits of the children of Adam go upward and the spirits of animals go downward onto the earth. I've seen that there is nothing better than for a person to enjoy his activities because that is his reward. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? Let me read that again. For who can enable him to see what will happen after he dies? Again, I observed all the acts of oppression being done under the sun. Look at the tears of those who are oppressed. They have no one to comfort them. Power is with those who oppress them. They have no one to comfort them. So I commended the dead who have already died more than the living who are still alive. But better than either of them is the one who has not yet existed, who has not seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. I have noticed something about people, and and it's this. People tend to live in the ditches. People just tend to live in the ditches. You ever been riding down the road and there's a car in front of you and maybe it's a rainy day and all of a sudden that car starts drifting off toward the right where there's a ditch and then they overcorrect and instead of being in this ditch, they are now in the opposite ditch. They miss the road completely. And I think that's just the way people can just be tempted to live. Don't raise your hand. How many of you thought at the beginning of the year you need to eat better? Why? Because you'd been in the ditch of overeating and not exercising. Yet January 1, new gym membership, no sugar, man, it's going to be a new me. How many of you made that promise before? Why? Because we live in the ditches. We live in the ditch of excess, or we're going to live in the ditch of asceticism and improve ourselves. And that's the way we can just respond to everything, and we can begin to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of all this? What am I doing with my life? So I want to talk to us this morning about purpose, life, and death. That's what I want to talk to us, because it seems to me that's exactly what the teacher is getting to under in Ecclesiastes 3 and the first part of chapter 4 that I read this morning. And there's going to be a couple of things that I want to really communicate to you today. The first thing is that God acts with purpose towards us. Secondly, I want to talk about how we tend to react to God's purpose. And then thirdly, I want to talk about how God redeems our life and our purpose. So when you begin reading in chapter 3, verse 1, there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under heaven. I kind of like the way the old King James translates this because it says there is a purpose for everything 
under heaven. And the idea in the Old Testament, when we see this word purpose, you know, our English definition means to act with purpose means that we're going to be deliberate or we're going to determine. And I would say that's exactly what God does. When you read about God, especially in the Old Testament, God says, and it is. That's the way God works. In fact, Isaiah 46.10, one of my favorite verses in Scripture says, I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago that what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place. I will do all my will. In essence, what God says about himself in the Bible is he is going to accomplish what he wants. He has determined what will be, and then he is going about in a way that, quite honestly, we don't always understand. How many times have you asked yourself, why is God doing this? What's going on? You might have even asked yourself, is God even here? Does God even care. So in the Old Testament, God is declaring what will be and that he's accomplishing his will. And then he begins to lay out everything he has observed in verses 2 through 8. And in those verses, what we can understand is that if God has a will for all things and all people, that is working as God intends. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that and when I think about that, it can be hard to wrap your head around that kind of thing. Is that the way God is? Is that who he is? And God, according to the teacher, what he is attempting to do, and it's not just attempting, what he is going to do, verse 14, is God works so that people will be in awe of him. God works so that people will be in awe of him. So ultimately, your place in fitting in what God is doing is to be in awe of him. And I want to tell you just a reality of what else Scripture says. In the book of Philippians, Paul told the Philippian church there was going to be a day where every mouth was going to confess Jesus is Lord. Every mouth. And it seems to me what that is practically going to mean is that right now, during your time and your place, you will confess Jesus is Lord, or that time is going to come when all people are before him and you will confess Jesus is Lord but everyone will declare he is Lord, and they will be in awe. Now, the the teacher also says in verse 10, as he talks about all these things that go on, searching, giving up the search, keeping, throwing things away, that verse 10 says, I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. The teacher is talking about the things we do as kind of like busy work. You ever been in school and you felt like the teacher was just giving you some busy work, just something to keep you occupied so we can just get through the end of the day? That doesn't seem to be the the right observation, though, of what God is declaring about us and our purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that things won't always be easy. In fact, it feels like a lot of the time when you're living, and, you know, I have just been really weighted this week as I have thought about this passage and just thinking about you. Because every one of you sitting here today are at different places on the scale of what you even think about life your experience, and you find yourself really weighing in to what verse 9 says. What does the worker gain from his struggles? And some of us sitting in this room right now may really be saying and asking ourselves, why has my life been so hard? Why do things always seem to be working against me? Why do other people get all the blessings and the benefits, 
and I am missing out. Is God holding out on me? Let me be real clear. I don't think that's the wrong question to be asking. I'm a big Psalms reader. I read the Psalms every day. And the psalmist is always asking his questions to God. It is biblical to wonder why life can be so hard and why things can be such a struggle. Because the truth is, and I want us to see this second point, we tend to react to God's purpose. When we read verses 2 through 8 of all the things under heaven that are happening, we do not read those things in a neutral posture. You don't just look at that and say, oh, well, it's just stuff that happens on the earth. Because that stuff has happened to you. You have encountered these things. And because you've encountered these things and you've had experiences with some or all, we tend to, as people, look at what God is doing and what's going on under the sun here on earth and all these activities, we tend to give one of two categories. We'll look at that and we'll say, that was good. And we'll look at something else and we'll say, that was bad. And that's where we live. It was good or it was bad. I think about how I thought about this passage this week. Just take the very first thing that he talks about in verse 2, that there is a time to give birth and a time to die. Now, you might not know this about me, but I love babies. I love them. When they can't do nothing but eat and poop and burp, I love them. Love them. Love them. That was my, some of my favorite times with our kids is when they were just like that. And two weeks ago, we got to see some friends of ours that's been on the mission field, and they come home to Greenville to be here for a little while, and they just had their fifth baby, baby Margot. And she wasn't even two weeks old when we were over there. And man, Ashley said, hey, somebody want to feed the baby? Yes, yes. And I'm feeding that baby. Oh, and it was wonderful. And then that baby just went back to sleep. And I just kind of laid back on the chair. And, you know, I got a nice belly. And I just laid that baby right there on my belly. And that baby slept. Ooh, man, that baby's good. That baby being born is good. That's good. Time to be born. That's good. The week before Christmas, a gentleman that I knew, I didn't know him well, 39 years old, about a year and a half ago discovered he had a very aggressive form of cancer, been married to his wife for 15 years, and I mean, what I did know about him, just one of the most godly men I've ever met, just You ever met people and you think to yourself, man, that person walks with God. And he walked with God. Has three sons, two teenage sons, one not quite a teenager. And on the 17th of December, he took his last breath and he died. A wife is left behind. Three sons now do not have a father. And it's really easy for us to look at that situation and say, Well, God, wouldn't it have been better for him to live? God, that's bad. That's bad. And that's the way we tend to see all of these things. And we begin to see that, okay, we hear that God works with purpose, and he has a desire that everyone be in awe of him, and yet I see what I experience, and I live what I live, and we see that there are realities about life. Verse 19, in essence, says we're going to work hard, and we're going to struggle, and if we can get in on the gift of enjoying what God gives us, that's good, but eventually we're just going to die. We're not going to be anymore. In fact, the teacher goes as far to say, we're no better off than the animals. Yet there's something very different about us that's not with the animals. 
God has put eternity in our hearts. I think that's why you notice when things don't go well, when things go bad, because you begin to think something must be broken. And then in chapter 4, we learn that there is oppression, there is wickedness, that the oppressor makes it hard for people. People live under the thumb of people who want power. Some of you sitting in this room are already dreading going to work tomorrow or going to class tomorrow because you feel like that person you work for or that teacher in your class just has you under their thumb. And it feels oppressive. And because we experience these things, and like I said, we need to remember, verse 11, we have eternity in our hearts. I think even in the worst of times, we feel this longing that there must be something better. But here's the other problem that verse 11 presents to us, and that's we're limited. The last part of verse 11 says this, no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. In other words, you don't see things from God's perspective. You don't see things from God's perspective. That's why you have found yourself saying, God, I just think it would have been better if, and then you fill in the blank with what you thought would have been better if. It's that question, it's that desire. And then we hear, okay, there is a purpose under heaven for everything that's going on, and I tend to think it would be better if, and so when we experience the things in verses 2 through 8, we draw some conclusions about life and what we're going to believe. Sometimes people get angry because of what has happened. And we're not just angry that the thing happened, we're angry at God that it happened. Or it causes us to doubt. Well, if if God was who he is, why did this happen? I just don't know. Or there's fear. Maybe I should just stay at the house. It's too dangerous out there to get involved with life. And then it comes to its worst reaction. We just decide we reject God. This past weekend, a young man that I've known for, gosh, 10 years, met him when he was in college, came to my small group at the church that my bride and I were leading, spent several years with this young man, drank a lot of coffee with this young man, ate hamburgers with this man, and he declared for the world. And I know his story, and I get it, but he declared that if God if God is who he says he is in the Bible, I don't want anything to do with him. Are you sitting in the room today and you're feeling like that? Maybe today is, well, I'll give church one more try. Maybe something will get said that will change my mind. Sorry for the bummer of the message so far. But I think the reality is, is when we have doubt and anger and fear and questions, we need to understand that's, that is just part of being human and trying to understand what God is doing. And even those who walk closely with God have had those questions before. In Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist, the one who had declared the Messiah is coming, Repent and believe. He's in jail. And he's beginning to wonder, well, if this is the Messiah, why am I in jail? And what does he do? He sends a couple of his followers to go talk to Jesus, to basically ask Jesus, hey, are you the one or is there somebody else coming? Jesus declares to John, I'm the one. And then in the Gospel of Mark, I always think about the story of the man who had a son that was possessed by a demon, even as a child causing all kinds of difficulty, trying to drown the child, trying to burn the child. And the father holds out hope. He's heard about Jesus, and he brings his son to Jesus. 
and said, listen, Jesus, if you can do something, if you can help us, will you? And Jesus looks at him and says, if, for the one that believes, God can do all things. And the man looks at Jesus and says, I have absolute perfect belief in you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. And that was a right confession for him to be honest before God of where he stood because he had just observed everything he had observed up until that point in his life. So I want to talk about how God redeems our life and purpose no matter where we may feel ourselves being because the real truth is sometimes in spite of what has happened in life in verses 2 through 8, some of us are walking faithfully with the Lord. Some of us have trusted God, even in the worst of circumstances. And by God's grace alone, we find ourselves being in awe. Remember, our limitations can have disastrous results, but it can also put us in a position to meet God in grace in a, in a way that we never thought possible. One of the things that the teacher says in verses 16 and 17, he says that there will be judgment to come. I've also observed under the sun, there's wickedness at the place of judgment and there's wickedness at the place of righteousness. I said to myself, God will judge the righteous and the wicked since there is a time for every activity and every work. So what the teacher is saying, there's going to come this time and it's obviously, as verse 19 says, when we die, after we die, at some point, that we are before God and we will be judged for what we have done, what we have believed. And then there is this question, verse 22. Who can enable people to see what will happen after he dies? The Bible declares that there are going to be some things that are going to happen after we die. I don't think that we should try to avoid believing it's true because the Bible says it is. And so we just, you know, sometimes it's kind of like, you know, remember when your, your, your dad or your mom, you say, we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting. And usually what that meant for me is we're going to have to deal with this not good thing or this hard thing that's going on, and we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting, meaning we're going to be honest about this, and we're going to do business with it. As lovingly and as powerfully as I can, I want to say to you, you need to do business with the fact that one day you're going to die and you're going to appear before God. And what I want to show you is either that is going to put you at a point where you're just going to say, well, no, sir, I'm just going to walk away, or you feel yourself being in holy dread about it. And then you've got to ask yourself the question, is there another way? Well, in the book of Hebrews, I want to read a, a very short passage out of Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 through 28. The writer of Hebrews is trying to show Christians how Jesus is our only hope. And he was the sacrifice that we need to take care of the ultimate problem of our lives, and that's sin. It's the sin of pride when you look at God and say, God, you shouldn't have done that. But here's what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. Okay, so there it is. After death will be judgment. We will appear before God. God will judge our works. He will judge our lives. He will judge what we have believed. Now, if it just stopped right there, we need to all be very afraid. And yet, verse 28 says this, So also Christ 
having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. See, one day you will stand before God to give an account of your life and what you did and what you believed, and you're either going to be on your own to give an account before God Or your confession is going to be, I'm with Jesus. And Jesus then says before his father, he's with me. I paid the price for his sin that he could belong to me. And so, even though one day, and again, dying, death, that's bad. The scriptures say that if we are in Christ, we belong to the father. That's that thing in you that pines away that says there's got to be something better. Listen, there is nothing on this planet that is ever going to be able to satisfy completely. It's momentary at best. This afternoon, I'm going to take the college students. Oh, man, love college students, and I love Mexican. And we're going to go eat us some Mexican. And the queso is amazing. And the fajitas will be fantastic. But by 5 o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to be hungry again. Why? Because nothing on this planet can ultimately satisfy us. Friends, I really believe Jesus came so that we could understand and know the purpose for which God created us to be in awe of him. Not that you have to work to be good enough, but trust and receive what Jesus provides through his death and resurrection. I want to show you an example of how I think this looks lived out. And it's in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, the church has just started. And one day, Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. And there is a, a man who cannot walk who is begging. And they tell him, listen, We don't have any money that we could give you, but what I do have, I'm going to give you freely in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And as you can imagine, this causes quite a stir. There are the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders who are not happy, and so they arrest Peter and John and begin to put them in jail and question them and rough them up and yell at them. And their feeling about what is happening is in verse 17. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, being the good news about Jesus, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So speaking in the name of Jesus, what it's going to cost Peter and John are threats and jail. And if you read the book of Acts, even worse. But what do they say? Verse 20, we are unable to stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. Jewish leaders want to stop it. Disciples want to live in it. What Scripture does not do is try to sidestep the fact that it's hard for these Christians to live in the world that they live in. Let me say that again. The Bible does not sidestep the fact that it's hard for these Christians in the world that they're living in. In fact, they fully recognize what's going on, and they're released after being threatened, and they come together with the church, and the church begins to pray this. And this is about as good an example in the Scripture that I can find of a people who kind of live and know that they're in a world of struggle, and yet live in awe of God. And this is what they pray, starting in verse 24. Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, and they're quoting Psalm 2, why do the Gentiles rage? And the peoples plot futile things. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, 
with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. They are affirming the fact They know that the death of Jesus was evil because an innocent man was killed, yet Herod and Pontius Pilate played their part to do what? Exactly what God predestined to happen. Verse 29, and now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this. He's dealing with this church that has a lot of problems, and he's talking to them finally about what's the most important thing, and that's the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus came, he died, and he rose again from the dead to defeat sin and death. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Write this down. Go home and read it. If the resurrection of Jesus hasn't happened, we are to be most pitied. Ultimately, modern 21st century translation. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, don't come over here on the east side of Greenville on Sunday morning. Don't do that. If Jesus is not alive, Go fishing on Sunday. If Jesus is not alive, go play golf. Go play pickleball. That's what everybody's playing nowadays. The early Christians don't declare that it's easy. Surely they're sitting in jail thinking, why is this happening to us? But here's the question, and this is what seems to be the reality of their testimony. Who would want a God that is just as surprised as they are by what's going on? And you know what? That teaching abounds nowadays. When you suffer, oh, God's just as surprised as you are. I'm just going to declare to you that's no comfort at all. If in the worst moments of my life, God is just as surprised as I am, what comfort is there? What hope is there? Ultimately, what those Christians had to pray and do is, God, we believe everything that happens is what you intend to happen, and you are accomplishing your will. And we may not understand why we're having to suffer this, but here's what we know. We need the God you are. So give us boldness so we can just keep telling people about Jesus. And that is really where you are placed this morning. You are not at death where one day you will stand before God. But listen, what you decide now is going to determine what happens then. I don't know what else you need to know to make a decision to follow Jesus. I don't know what that decision is. But it seems to me that you're left with a reality that you just have to come to Jesus about. You're either going to live your life, complain about how hard it is, and die and stand before God without Christ. Or you decide, yes, life is hard. I don't understand. I don't know why these things happen. And what I think is interesting is sometimes the thing that we tend to call bad becomes the very thing that helps us to see, I'm not going to make it in this life unless I have God. And so we have to decide today, will I trust in what Jesus holds out to me in the light of death and judgment, or am I going to go my own way? God is not 
looking for perfect people this morning. He is just looking for people to take the offer of salvation he hands out today. And if you're a Christian today, the way you respond to this message, you sense something's going on and you're hearing something maybe in a way you've never heard it today. You just trust Jesus. And you say, Jesus, I need you. I need the forgiveness you give through the cross and through your resurrection. Or you walk out the door and you don't. But what I would encourage you to do today, no matter where you are, Christian or non-Christian, struggling, not struggling, is just before God to call out to him and trust the fact that what he says about himself is what he's really doing, to create in you a desire to be in awe of him. Ladies and gentlemen, I've asked a thousand questions and a thousand times. I wish it wasn't this way. Why did this have to happen? But all I know is here we are at this moment, and today we decide. I just want to ask you to bow your head. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. We're just going to be quiet for a few moments. And what I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity just before the Lord today to call out to him and do what you need to do in this moment. I'd like to go out singing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I can't think of a more fitting opening verse to a final song after what Rodney has just preached to us and declared to us for us to sing, in Christ alone my hope is found. But in the face of hurt and pain and confusion... Our hope is found in Christ. He's my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storms. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when tears, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Would you stand together and sing with us, church?
church.